Okay, Fran, we can begin. Okay, I guess uh, yeah, we started recording, right? Yes. Okay. okay, good. Okay, thanks, Ajan, for the for the kind invitation and and an introduction. So, well, let me just start. So, as you as you see, I mean, I just like gave a, um, my talk a quite generic uh, title. So. Of course, I will not going to talk about all the aspects of ice and methods. I will will talk to some. We'll talk about some spe specific uh, features that uh, which I'm like uh, particularly interested. Okay, so I, I will just start trying to 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 give a very superficial idea of what a vile semi metal is, um, and then I will just so. Uh, also briefly introduce what are quantum anomalies, which is a, a particular aspect of quantum field theories, which is relevant for, for this type of, mat of materials and, and which is it's going to be basically the focus of, uh, of this talk. Um, along, the, along the talk, I, I will also show some specific uh, experimental uh, signatures, uh, like supporting the, the ideas of uh, of the contributions of, uh, of quantum anomalies in, in, in such type of systems. Um, and then to conclude, I will just like move to a sort of like more uh, theoretical uh, point of view, which is the discussion of, uh, or the construction of, of strongly coupled um, by semi-metals by, by means of holography. And I will just also discuss some of the, the outputs uh, of those constructions. So then let me start. Okay, so I will start, as I said, just like a very briefly and superficial, just like defining what a Weissen metal is. So a Weissen metal is just, let's say that it's a semiconductor. And we said with semiconductor, I mean that uh, it's a system in which the valence and the conduction band uh, either touch in some isolated points or, or they are very close to each other. Um, an important requirement for a Weissman method to exist is that uh, time reversal or parity uh, have to be broken. Um, in the case of, uh, okay, so then the point is that these type of systems uh, or in this type of systems, the, the balance and conduction bands, they touch in some even number of, of, of points in the below zone. And those, and those points are very special because uh, they are singular in the sense that uh, the derivative of the, of the dispersion relation at that point is not, uh, is not well defined, it's not uh, it's singular, okay? So the presence of those points uh, uh, comes with a, with a peculiar, uh, with a particularity and it's the fact that they, those points uh, from a quantum mechanical uh, point of view are sources of, uh, of, very, of very curvature, okay? So in, at, that, at, the, at this precise point uh, in momentum space, the, there is a monopole charge that, that has a quantized value, okay? That has a, an integer value. The most, uh, or, or the better understood case is the case in which that uh, monopole charge takes value one, which is the standard case of, of Weissen and metals uh, everybody talks about, in which the, the dispersion relation of the, of the quasi-particles has a linear, uh, a linear form, okay? There are some sort of generalizations of that, of, of that, uh, of that case that I will mention in the, during the talk in which the, the monopole charge takes a, a higher value than one. And in that case, uh, or in those cases, uh, the dispersion relation is not linear anymore, but okay, you will see uh, soon. There are, other, there are other cases in which you, you can have like a higher monopole charge, which I will not discuss in this case. Some people use, uh, usually fit them within the class of, of, the class of systems of the vile semi-metals, but in my language, they, they, they will not be considered as vile semi-metals, which are like the, the the triple point or four, or four points, uh, which are, or, or in other words, the, the systems in which, uh, well, people usually also call them like a higher higher spin systems. So th in those systems, 
uh, well, I can just like do an example for let's if, if we assume that um, this is a, a by semi metal, okay, this is just momentum and this is energy, okay. This is the, the, the type of, of cases I will study and the cases of this high in, in the case of the, these higher spin uh, systems, what we have, for example, in the triple point case, what we have is that the dispersion relation does something like that. On top of the cone, there is like a flat band intersecting the, uh, the band touching. And there are other examples in which we can have also four, uh, and it, at, a fourth degenerate point in the, in the Brillouin zone. These cases are not the cases I will be considering here. Okay, so let's just let me just show you a picture, for example, of a, this is a theoretically, or I mean the prediction of how the the, the band structure of a, one specific bison metal, which is the tantalum arsenide. So as you can see in the left side, so in this plot, as you can see, okay, the band structure is like quite messy, but if if you just we just zoom around the Fermi energy that is just sitting right here. There are two sets of, of, of vial points, which uh, for these materials they are called like W1 and W2. They're relatively, uh, the W2 type of, of, of uh, vial points are relatively, are very close to the Fermi energy. And there are, the other set of, of points are slightly below the, the Fermi energy, okay? But then as you can see, precisely, you have this type of intersection here uh of the buy points something that uh i think i didn't mention properly is that uh in general the amount of buy points that you will have in the brillouin zone is an even is, is even so you need to have the same amount of left-handed of, uh, of the left-handed uh vial fermions as the as right-handed fermions okay that's another 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 example but in this case, this is not, uh, so this is the zirconium pentatelluride, which is not a vial semi-metal in the sense that the vial points are not split in the, it's not, they're not split in the, in the, in the Brillouin zone. They're just sitting in the same point. That's what typically people call uh, a Dirac semi-metal. Okay, so in this case, what, what this, this is an, ex this is a real picture. This is just uh, an RPS picture of, uh, of the dispersion relation. And what you see here is precisely the, the valence band of the of the material. And there is a problem here because I have this thing, and you don't see the the references. Okay, good. Another example that uh, that I I find quite uh, an, another material that is quite uh, interesting is uh, is mercury terrorite under compressive strain. The reason this material is quite is is is, is quite relevant to, to un, for the understanding of the properties of semi metals is the fact that so the Fermi energy is sitting exactly at zero at the at the neutrality point. Okay, so the Fermi energy of of oh, sorry, how do I go back? Okay, so the Fermi energy sits right on the on the on the intersection of the of the vial points. And then in the same, using similar techniques as, uh, similar experimental techniques as the people uh, use for graphene, you can just gate and, and, and move the Fermi energy and go from, from a sort of like a N type of doping to a Q type of, of doping. Because in general, for, for other type of vice metals or for real vice metals, let's say, because this is artificial in the sense that, uh, that exists only on this type of, uh, of strain, um, the Fermi energy sits quite far from the Fermi, I mean, the Fermi energy sits quite far from the neutrality point. Therefore, it's not easy to move around the, to move the Fermi energy and see what, how, how the system behave uh, depending on the location of the, of the Fermi energy. Okay, some, as, as you already saw in principle, because, okay, those, those are, gapless system so we don't have any mass scale in the in the system so let's say quote unquote that, that this is just like a kind of scale invariant uh system so and then for a for a scale invariant system in three plus one dimensions we can 
if we can just like if you we want to estimate how the the the, the optical conductivity should be uh, for frequencies which are large enough such that we can uh, ignore um, momentum relaxation and all these uh, processes that will be relevant for the DC conductivity, we can just do this sort of like a dimensional analysis. So I mean I don't know the the the, the current will couple to the gauge field in this form, sorry, before x, okay? Which means that, which tells, tells us that the current will have dimension of mass three and the gauge field will have dimension of mass one, okay? Therefore, if we have something like Ohm's law, and then here we have the electric field, the electric field will have dimension two the current, as we saw, has dimension three, therefore the, the conductivity will have dimension one. So if the system is, uh, is, is scale invariant, we don't, we don't have any mass scale, that implies that the conductivity necessarily will have, it needs to go linear with the frequency of the system. And then here I show for ex uh, some experimental data for tantalum arsenide, where we precisely notice that linear behavior. First, we have a, a, an expected through the peak for small in, enough frequency, which is not uh, the regime I'm just discussing here. And then we, we, we notice an, an intermediate region in which the, the optical conductivity is perfectly fit by a, by a linear fitting. Okay, so at this point I will not, I, I mean, I will make comments on this uh, other region and the more or less at the end of the talk. The point that I wanted just like to emphasize is that in, in fact we see this linear behavior that is some sort of like a support of not having any relevant uh, uh, mass scale in, in the system. As we can, uh, this, the, the optic, yes. So the assumption is that the temperature uh, effects will be small uh, in this high, high, in some intermediate frequency regime? Yes, I mean, I'm assuming here that frequency is the largest energy scale. So I'm assuming things like chemical potential, temperature, all these things are like small enough such that in, some, such that I could just imagine that I, that I can model the system just like a zero temperature, zero density uh, system. Because everything, everything that is just related or controlled by temperature and density will be just uh, some, somehow sitting right here in this, uh, in this region. Okay, That's thanks. My, Yes, that's, that's my um, the assumption of the, in this argument. So, and then, well, here, this, this is a, a weak coupling computation for, for the conductivity. And as, as you see, okay, that's, this N here is just like the number of, uh, of points you have, of pi points. And as you see, it goes just linear with the frequency. Okay. Now I will just, after this like very brief and uh, as I said, superficial introduction of, uh, of Bayesian metals, I will just shift to, to introduce what are quantum anomalies, okay? I will, I will not, I will try to do it, to do that in a very sort of like a intuitive uh, way without entering into in, in many technical details. But the point is that quantum anomalies are some, is a property of quantum field theories, in particular in even dimensions, that happens in even dimensions. So, okay, and then some sort of like a facts that, that okay. So in quantum field theories, uh, certain global symmetries can be violated when you try to quantize that, that, quantum, that, that field theory, okay? In particular, uh, in, in massless, in theories with massless fermions, um, in which you have what is all, I mean, the so-called axial and vector global symmetries, those symmetries may be anomalous. So the statement of quantum anomalies in the end is that it's not possible to simultaneously preserve axial and vector, and vector symmetries. In the end, we know that the, 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 the currents of the, the vector currents of, uh, for example, in QED, couples to, to the gauge field, I mean, we know that couples to the photon, which means that necessarily we have to impose conservation of the, of the electromagnetic current, which necessarily implies that the axial current will be violated. 
the conservation of the axial charge will be violated. Okay, let's try to be a little bit more precise. So in principle, as, as I mentioned, okay, we have uh, some classical field theory associated to, to each, uh, sorry, associated to each uh, symmetry, global symmetry, where we have a conserved current. So in particular, I mean, if we have rotational invariance, then that implies that momentum will be, uh, angular momentum will be conserved. If we have translational, translational invariance, then there will be something like energy and momentum that will be conserved. And if we have a charge field such that we can just like uh, shift the phase of that of that field, that will imply that, the, that there is some notion of charge conservation. Okay, then let's just go to the example of like a Dirac theory. Then we will try to connect with this Dirac theory with everything I mentioned before with about regarding the bias and the metals. But just okay, let's start just with classical Dirac theory. So that, that system, that, that Lagrangian I wrote there, it is invariant under, under translations, rotations, and and um, and phase uh, redefinition. I will focus only on translation. Here I will focus on translation and phase rotations, but then there is, as I mentioned, there is a, a, an operator that is conserved, which is energy and, and, and momentum, which is just en encoded in this, uh, what is the so-called stress energy momentum tensor. And then we have the U1 current that is associated to the phase redefinition. Here, I'm just basically writing the continuity equations associated to these two uh, quantities. In particular, we can take a, a representation of the Dirac matrices in which the Lagrangian, the Dirac Lagrangian takes this form. Okay, in which basically I have to compose the four components fermion in two two components fermions that I'm just calling psi minus and psi plus. So this psi minus is what is usually called left-handed fermion and this psi plus the right-handed fermion. And then the mass term, as you see here, it just, it's just a term that is mixing, that is somehow coupling these two fermions. But if I just switch off this, this, this term, I just remove the, I just remove the mass, ter mass term, we notice that there is an enhancement of the symmetries because now I can independently rotate or I mean I independently I can independently shift the phase of that fermion or I can shift the phase of that fermion which implies that I have to conserve for the system with, without mass I have to conserve currents that I'm just calling j minus and j plus each of them and in the classical theory will satisfy the how do I do to, how do I shift this thing okay stupid so okay i have two conservation equations for for j, j minus and for j plus so in principle what is called vector current is the is the combination of the j minus plus j plus and when and every 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 time i talk about actual current is the combination of j minus and j plus which obviously for the m for the m equals zero case this j and j phi will be conserved as a consequence oops as a consequence of the of these two conservation equations, okay? Now let's go to the quantum theory. If we try to quantize that theory, okay, we will realize that we will have two types of excitations with a dispersion relation that, that is shown in the, uh, it's a little bit, I'm sorry about that. Okay, what I wanted to do is with that dispersion relation of this form. So in the case of M equals zero, as you see, we, okay, we will have like two cones. I will, we will, this, their dispersion relations of the particles, if I just plot the antiparticles uh, energy with a minus sign that reproduces the, the, this, the usual cone that people draw when they are talking about uh, bile or the uh, type of particles. This theory has two types of excitations, one with, with, positive uh, with positive charge and one other ones with negative charge, which are precisely antiparticles and particles, respectively. Um, in the M equals zero case, as I said before, the number of anti, I mean, the number of particles um, minus the number of uh, antiparticles, let's say, or no, the, the number of particles with, without defined chirality, with a plus chirality on 
minus the number of particles with the left chirality is conserved, okay? The point is that when you try to, when I mean, properly study the quantum theory, you will conclude that that is not possible, that that will not happen, that the right-hand side of the conservation equation, the right-hand side of this thing has something that depends on the Planck constant. And that's precisely the, the quantum anomaly appearing when you try to quantize the theory. How that happens? How is that possible? Okay, so then I will just try to give you some sort of like a intuitive picture, as I said before. So when you try to quantize the theory, in principle, the fermions have to satisfy the anti-commuting commutation relations that I'm just showing here. Okay, so which means this, this direct delta in the right hand side means that the product of two fermions evaluated at the same point is a, is a singular quantity. The operator that is just side, side bar evaluated at the same point is a singular quantity. And as you can see, the definition of the currents requires evaluating at the same point the two fermions. So that, that's a, that operator is not a well-defined quantity, which means that in order to, to make sense of it, you need to regularize. When you try to regularize, you will conclude that it's not, I mean, you have to pick a regularization scheme and that regularization scheme necessarily will, necessarily will break either the left-handed symmetry or the right-handed symmetry. And when you remove the cutoff, you will conclude that it's not possible to remove the, cut, the cutoff in such a way that in the end, both currents are conserved. Another type of argument that sometimes is, uh, uh, I mean, that is kind of like a popular argument is that in terms of the path intervals, okay? If you try to define, for example, you introduce some background fields, A and A phi, each of them coupling to the, to the two parents, J and J phi, and compute the effective action by doing the path interval. In principle, that quantity should be gauge invariant. In gauge invariant, I mean, if I just do a gauge transformation of A or a gauge transformation of A five, the quantity W effective should be invariant. The action is it's invariant. So because the previous action I showed is clearly gauge invariant. So where is the, 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 the anomaly coming from? Because if the currents are not conserved, it means that the effective action cannot be gauge invariant. That happens because the measure of the path integral is not invariant. If you properly define the measure of the path integral and you see how it behaves when you do a gauge transformation, you will conclude that after doing a transformation, the measure in the new fields prime acquires this factor here. Okay, and that's the source of the of the anomaly from a from a path integral perspective. Okay. As I said before, so the anomaly is, is a statement that you cannot simultaneously conserve vector and axial currents. In principle. By adding contact, uh, by adding counter terms to the action, we could shift the conservation fully to the to the axial sector, as I'm just showing here. Or I can keep it in both sides, or I can keep, or I can just shift it completely to the vector current. The point is that we know that this current J couples to the photon, therefore it needs to be conserved. Otherwise, when I construct an interacting theory of the framing with the photon, I I, I would get a an inconsistent theory. Okay, so yeah, let me just, uh, oops, what did I do? Okay, so in principle, that uh, uh, how do I go back? Okay, yes, so the story is that this equation here. This equation here is just an operator equation and I can understand and I can just obtain this, uh, the one point functions of this, uh, of this current by differentiating the effective action. I have to find my effective action here. I just do the, the path integral and by differentiating respect to A or A5, I can compute endpoint functions of the, of the current J, J, mu, J, J, J mu and J mu five. So in particular, if I take three derivatives as I'm just like uh, showing here, 
I can compute this uh, three-point function, which, given the word identity I showed before, becomes this uh, becomes this quantity here. Okay, this quantity here can be obtained diagram diagrammatically in a perturbative uh, in a perturbative way, even though quantum anomalies are not uh, a perturbative uh, aspect of, of uh, quantum field theories via the via this triangle diagram. Okay. So the point is that not only this type of triangle diagram, the triangle diagram with uh, with three insertions of the of a current is non-vanishing in, in, in three plus one dimensions. There is another diagram that is non-vanishing and is relevant and is relevant for the for the quantum anomalies business. And it's and it's, in, it's the triangle diagram in which I, I'm just insert in that in this vertex a current and this in these other two vertex the stress energy tensor. Okay, I'm just like I am just writing H mu here because the, the fluctuation of the metric is the quantity that couples to the to the stress energy tensor. Okay. The non-vanishing of this uh, of this uh, triangle diagram is what is usually called mixed uh, gauge gravitational anomaly. Okay. And in particular, then the full non-conservation of the of the axial current takes the form you see here in the in this case in which I'm just considering uh, a single, a left-handed and a right-handed uh, Fermi. That's the form it takes. These coefficients C A and C G are what they are called. So the, are the quantities that are, are called uh, gauge uh, anomaly coefficient or, or gravitational anomaly coefficient. Okay. In particular, for this theory, I'm just considering they take this form. Okay. Where basically these one, these ones I'm just uh, including here are just the charges of the particles that are that are running inside this uh, inside inside this loop. Okay. In general, I'm just writing here S B because if I have a set of of, uh, of fermions or if I have some sort of flavor symmetry, this S captures, I mean is, is capturing the information of those charges. So for in the, in the example I'm just considering, this S is just one for for right handed for left handed fermions and minus one for for left-handed fermions. If that's the full content of the theory, then the, the anomaly coefficients takes this form, C A and C G. If we just generalize to a case in which uh, I, I may have a set of, uh, of fermions with U1 charges or some generic uh, flavor symmetry, then that's how the, the full war identity looks like. Okay, it takes this form, where now this BA is the gravitational anomaly coefficient, which is just basically the trace of the charges of the fermion, which again, if we just th think on a single uh, vial fermion, this S is just plus minus one. Otherwise, it's just, it will be just a trace of those, uh, of those matrices. And in the case of the, of the pure gauge, uh, in the in the case of the pure gauge anomaly, this term here will be proportional to this to this quantity, the ABC, which is the what is called the again is the is the the pure gauge anomaly coefficient. So I decided to write uh, the the word identity in this form because here these two relations here are precisely the relations that tells you if you have a, an anomaly in the system. So you will have a quantum anomaly in the, system, in the system if and only if this quantity vanishes or this quantity vanishes in the case of the, of the gravitational anomaly. If that combination, which, is, which depends only on which are the charges of the system, depends which is the matter content you have. It doesn't, it doesn't care about which type of interactions you have, how the fermions interact or anything. It just care which, is the, 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 which are the charges of the system, okay? So that's the relevance of these quantities and they will play an important role in the form of the, of the uh, anomaly induced transport coefficients that, uh, that we will uh, discuss later on, okay? Then the point is that um, one of the magical features, let's, I mean, let's use magical, I don't know, it's a, it's a 
astonishing feature of, of, of the of the business of the of the quantum anomalies is that even though they are just like a, a, a microscopic uh, property of the of the system they have uh, an implication or, or they leave an imprint in the in the transfer properties in macroscopic properties of the system sort of like a and it's in certain analogy with superconductivity in the sense that it's a purely quantum uh, uh, effect, but but it's a uh, but it appears under, under the macroscopic level. Okay, so the most important type of uh, kind of transfer coefficients that we have in this when we have axial anomalies are the so-called chiral magnetic and chiral vortical effect. Okay, which I I'm just like describing here. So the sigma b is what is called the chiral magnetic conductivity. And this sigma v is what is uh, usually called the chiral vortical conductivity. Okay, as you can see, these uh, these quantities are proportional to the to the anomaly coefficients. So the chiral magnetic conductivity is proportional to this dA dc. Okay, which means that if there are no anomalies, I mean, it, which means that those transitions are present in the system if and only if the system is anomalous. Okay. Then just allow me to give you some sort of like intuitive in some intuition on why the chiral, why why this uh, we are effect of the chiral magnetic uh, conductivity happens because as you can see here this this expression is just telling us that if you apply a magnetic field you will get a current that is parallel to the magnetic field which is totally counterintuitive. In order to get some intuition on why that happens. Let me just remind you the following. So this the type of, this, of particles we are talking about are massless particles. So a massless particle cannot be quiet. A, a massless particle will always move, okay? There are no frames, there are no rest frames for the particles. That particle will be always moving. Then if you apply a magnetic field to that system, the Landau's level spectrum, we have a very peculiar type. Of, imagine just that, oops. Imagine we have just a single chiral particle, a left-handed particle, for example. If you apply a magnetic field, there will be one of the momenta that will be a good quantum number. And after solving the Landau level problem, we will see that we have a gapless, that, we, that there's still a gapless uh, mode, but which is chiral because it propagates only in one direction. And then we will have some sort of like gap modes, okay? In addition, we know that if we have a magnetic field in the system, if we have a magnetic, and, and the magnetic field necessarily, if this case set is the, is, the, is the conservative momentum, it means that the magnetic field is just pointing in the set direction, okay? But then we know that if a, a, a spinful particle, or in this case, a particle with helicity, will try to, align its spin or its angular momentum with the magnetic field, which means that so the magnetic, so this, the spin of the particle will be parallel or anti-parallel depending on, on, on the charge of the particle with the magnetic field, okay? Which means that necessarily, if I excite one particle here, this particle will move along, along the magnetic field. All the parts, if I just excite one particle here, another particle here, they, they will just move along the magnetic field. And that's precisely the carrier magnetic effect. That's what we are seeing here. In the case of the carrier vortical conductivity, it's kind of like more subtle because vorticity, so this omega mu here is the vorticity. So if you just imagine some fluid, gas of, the, of those uh, particles, and you give some sort of angular momentum to, to that gas, then that, that expression is just telling us that we'll have a current that is parallel to the angular momentum of the system. So the point is that vorticity is not a quantity that has a microscopic sort of like a, a understanding. It's not like a magnetic field that is, I know what the magnetic field couples to it from the microscopic uh, perspective. So it's not, it's not so, so intuitive as the case of the kind of magnetic conductivity. So the point is that, so the, and then the moral, the moral here is that as long as we have a system with a mixed gauge gravitational anomaly, the carrier vertical conductivity will receive this contribution here, 
which is proportional to t squared. And if we have the, the pure gauge anomaly, the carrier vortical conductivity will receive this contribution and the carrier magnetic, this other one here. Okay. Uh, oh, Fran, yes. uh, can I ask something? Yes. So the argument that you gave is, is nice, but uh, you can also get these things from the equilibrium partition function approach, right? I mean, uh, these particular. That's right. Uh, That's right. I mean, I didn't mention how to obtain those for those expression, of course. I mean, there are, there are several ways of obtaining them. I just show that, that how they, I mean, you could use a Kubo formula. You can, as you, as you mentioned, you can go to partition function. You can even just in, in hydro by imposing um, entropy arguments, you could also obtain the expressions. That, I mean, there are several ways of obtaining. Yeah, exactly. And many of these do not care about uh, the specific field content that contributes to the anomaly. For example, it can come from uh, self-dual fields, uh, and uh, uh, cell cell dual antisymmetric fields can also contribute to anomalies, I guess. And uh, right, so it, it 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 should be there, irrespective of the field content. Uh, but uh, but in your question, uh, but in your in your in your in your way to see this anomaly physically, uh, what about like having a rotation uh, in the system? Does it help to understand this uh, chiral vortical effect? I mean. So the point is that actually a way to obtain the chiral vortical conductivity is via Kubo formula, okay? And uh, the way of obtaining this Kubo formula is kind of using the equivalence principle because locally, so locally you cannot really distinguish if, if, if you have a gravitational magnetic field. I'll, 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 I mean, the gravitational analog of a, of a magnetic field or if the system is rotating. So if you just sit in the, in the rest frame, let's say, of the, of the fluid, locally, you cannot distinguish if the source of, of if, if what, you are, what is happening is that you are rotating or that there is a gravi gravitomagnetic field, let me call it. And allows you to write a Kubo formula for the chiral vertical conductivity, okay? Which is basically, I mean, as you can imagine, the, the, the Kubo formula for, uh, for the chiral magnetic uh, conductivity will be a JJ two point function, okay? But the Kubo formula for the chiral vertical conductivity will be a JT uh, two point function. And the reason you have T energy momentum tensor, okay? And the reason you have this JT is precisely what, what I told you, because you can just go to the rest frame of the, of the rotating fluid and from that, point of view, you cannot really distinguish. So it's completely equivalent to have a, in linear response, a small gravitomagnetic field than the system rotating. But the point is that that nice picture that, that I draw with the Landau levels will not apply here because a gravitational field will not uh, generate Landau levels. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Okay, good. So now, my intention is just, okay, let's move back to, to vice and metals and let's try to connect all this sort of like a field theory and maybe for some of you quite abstract uh, constructions with uh, what's going on in, uh, in the vice and metal room. Okay, and why all this story is like uh, applicable. Okay, typically a condensed matter theorist will tell you, okay, well, um, the Hamiltonian, the single particle Hamiltonian uh, around the, the neutrality point in the intersection of the bands will take this form, okay, for a generic vile semi-metal, okay? And when generic, I, when I say generic, I mean uh, when, this, when this monopole charge I mentioned before, this very flux charge takes value one, two, or three, okay? That's the form. Of that Hamiltonian. For example, in the case n equal one, so if you set n equal one there, you will see that, I mean, you can notice that that's the, I set n equal one here, this thing becomes just like the Weyl Hamiltonian, okay? Because this is p per times cosine of five and p per times sine of five. This is px and this is, and this other one is just py. This is just a Weyl um, Hamiltonian. But in the case in which n is not one, it's not the Weyl Hamilton, it's sort of like a more exotic uh, Hamiltonian, which actually has a dispersion relation that takes this form, 
again, we see that if n is equal to one, we just get like p squared plus p per squared plus p z squared. We have just like linear dispersion in all directions. But then if n is equal to two or three, which are the allowed uh, values for, for the real material, what we will have is that the, the particle will disperse linearly along one direction, which is this uh, direction that we pick, like I pick to be z. And then along the transverse direction, it will just like propagate like quadratically or cubic. Okay, that's what is uh, this in the case of n equal two or three, that's, that's the so called multivile semi metal case. As I mentioned also, um, one feature of, that, of those systems is that they have a very curvature that is not trivial and that the very, that this uh, very curvature is monopole like with the charge that takes an integer value. So if you just compute the very curvature for, for the Hamiltonian I showed before, okay, you take this formula that is not, this expression that is not uh, particularly illuminating, but I'm just here plotting just like some sort of projection of the, of that uh, vector field. And then you see how here in the center, we have a sort of a singularity. We have a, some sort of like a monopole type. If you just take a, a sphere, uh, some surface, and it doesn't have to be a sphere. If you take some sort of an arbitrary surface surrounding the K equals zero, the P equals zero point, and you just compute the flux of that, of that quantity, you will conclude that the flux of that quantity is precisely N, is the integer I, I mentioned before. Okay, now I will try to connect uh, the Hamiltonian I, I showed before for, for single particles with a quantum field theory, why? So at least for me, from my perspective, I mean, that's the, easy, the, my, the best way I can uh, understand like many particle physics or uh, many body physics, okay? I'm not uh, smart enough to, 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 to try to understand many body systems uh, beyond the uh, quantum field theory. So the story is that this, uh, okay, just let me go back to, to the Hamiltonian. Okay, exactly. We come back to Hamiltonian. We will consider first the case n equal one. Okay, then as, I, as we noticed before, the n equal, n equal one case, this is just the, the vile Hamiltonian. Okay, so, if I want to write uh, the simplest uh, vile semi-metal, a model for the simplest vile semi-metal, I will need to have something of this type. I will need to have a left-handed point here and a right-handed this momentum, okay? This momentum space. I will need to have something like a left-handed point here, right-handed point here, and these things, okay, well, they will, uh, deviate from linearity at high enough energies, okay? A nice way of doing that, of modeling this, uh, this type of behavior is with this Hamiltonian, with this Lagrangian, sorry, okay? What are, which are the ingredients I'm just including in this Lagrangian? Okay, well, so this, I have a li my linear in momentum, now I'm just, I'm not in momentum space, I'm just like in real space, so then that's the, that's the role of this derivative here. This psi is not a vile fermion, it's a Dirac fermion, okay? So imagine, so imagine that I just momentarily, imagine that I just set these two things to zero, okay? That, what it will describe is just like a Dirac fermion, a massless Dirac fermion, which corresponds to having a left-handed particle and a right-handed particle that are just sitting in the same place in momentum space. I'm just, I'm just having something like one left-handed here, and another left-handed sitting exactly at the same point. But in a vile semi-metal, these two, these two points are not necessarily in the same place, okay? They are not sitting necessarily in the, in the, in the same place. And then that's the role of this quantity here. So this, this operate, I mean, in the insertion of this, uh, of this extra operator, what it does is just to shift the left-handed to the left in for a volume like ma minus uh, b half and the right handed to the right by a, by a b half uh, value, okay, in the set direction. And the master, what it will just do, well, actually, I think 
yes, I have a, a better picture of that here. Okay, so the and the master, what it will do is just like this is a four, we have like four degrees of freedom. Two of them will be just gap. We don't care about them. And then the other two will be just like a, depending on the values of the, the, the relative values between M and B, we will have these three phases, okay? This is like, okay, the phase that we will call like by some metal phase, which corresponds with having B larger than M, okay? And the distance we have here will be just given by the square root of B squared minus M squared. In the case in which B is more than the mass, this is just like a trivial insulator. We have, we open a gap, okay? And then there is this special point, okay? It's some sort of like a quantum, we have a, a sort of quantum phase transition that is connected by this uh, quantum critical point that we will have something to say about it uh, in the end. But so far at this point, we are just like interested in this phase here, okay? Then the, as, I said, as uh, I mentioned, this is the phase of the device the meta phase, which requires B to be larger than M. Okay, now the point is that, okay, we have a one, we have a, at low energies, or I mean, if we, if we set M equals zero, what we will have is just like a cone sitting in minus B half, another cone sitting in plus B half, and they, don't, they just don't see each other because the mass, the role of the mass is precisely connecting the left-handed with the right-handed. So if, if, I, if I set M equals zero, we have just like two cones that just like go um, all the way up to infinity. Okay, in this model. So then if we apply the formulas for the for the chiral magnetic conductivities, that's what we what we get. Okay. This uh, this quantity here is with this the so the so-called anomalous whole conductivity that happens that, that happens uh, or that appears in, in time reversal breaking uh, by semi metals, which is the case. And then okay, we see this is the chiral magnetic conductivity that is sourced by an axial magnetic field. This is the current magnetic conductivity in the axial current sourced by the magnetic field, as it should be the current magnetic conductivity vanishes in, in equilibrium in the, in the electric current. The current vertical conductivity in the axial current has this uh, T square contribution. So the point is that if we set M equals zero, M explicitly breaks the, explicitly breaks the, the, the axial symmetry. So the, we, still, we are still preserving the vector symmetry, but the axial symmetry is broken. So which means that the current J5 will receive an, an, an anomalous, I mean, will receive an anomalous dimension because it's not conserved anymore. So then this, in particular, these two expressions here will not be universal anymore because the, because the current J5 is not conserved. This mu5, B, I mean, all these axial fields that are precisely B, E5, and mu5, somehow they will renormalize. And in other words, what will happen is that in order to compute the, the in, in order to compute that, that current, you will need to compute things like, like this. So for example, like J5, um, for example, for the, for the anomalous whole conductivity, then we will have like E5 here, and then we will have B, okay? We will have to compute this diagram, okay? But these three vertices will renormalize, okay? And the renormalization of those vertices, when you account for the renormalization of those vertices, or those, the renormalization of those vertices, sorry, will be the source of the renormalization of the, of the conductivity. Now the conductivity will not take this, just the simple, value one over six pi square, you will have, you need, you will need to account by, for the renormalization of these points. And that will happen with all, with all the, with all the terms that are associated to the axial, I mean, to the, to the axial background fields, which are not a background field anymore from the quantum field theory perspective, they will be just like couplings in the theory because the current they are coupling to is not, is not a conserved current. So that current will acquire a anomalous dimension. 
Okay. Now, so uh, again, how much time do I have? Uh, well, you have 20 minutes or more. Okay. So, yes, uh, I have to sorry, start. sorry. You have, you have, I think, five, yeah, 20, 22 minutes more, 22 minutes. Okay. Yes, let me speed up a little bit. So, Everything, okay, everything we, we, we just discussed so far was just like for the n equal one case in which we have like this sort of like a nice Dirac uh, Lagrangian for the system. Um, Fran, I, can, I, case, uh, yes. can I ask a brief question about your previous slide? So normally when, you, when, you, when we write the transport coefficients, we assume that the background is isotropic, but your Hamiltonian here breaks isotropy. Uh, so essentially, do you, uh, you should think of this E cross B like terms as new kind of transport coefficients? Uh, okay, let's just let me go back to understand properly what you mean. Yes, okay, tell me. So this E cross B like terms, uh, so B is some kind of background field that breaks isotropy. Around, yes. So usually we don't consider these kind of, uh, when, when, when we write transport coefficients, we write that, that we think that the thermal uh, state is isotropic or the state about which we are considering transport is isotropic. But here you are breaking isotropy. So are these sort of new kind of transport coefficients? Um, okay, what you are saying is, I mean, you are right in what you are saying, but I mean, it's not the fact that we just consider that the, I, the the thermal state is isotropic is not a, is not a necessary requirement. Uh, in fact, when you relax that, that requirement, you will, we will see that there are some sort of like new physics, new transport coefficients that will appear. There is an, an interesting one that I will mention if I'm lucky, if I have enough time uh, in the end. Um, somehow, actually, so this, these quantities, so this, so all this, uh, this, this term here, and these uh, E cross B are, uh, are related between them. And actually they are just related by, they are just, the reason for them to be there comes from, let me just go back here, okay? When I was discussing this slide, I forgot to mention what are these, these two things here, okay? So this is, this, 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 these, two, these two quantities here are just some polynomials in the background field, which are necessary which are necessary by consistency. So this is just the John Simons uh, polynomial that allows you, that, that allows this current to be the, the derivative of the partition function respect to the gauge field. Let me just put it this way, okay? And this other polynomial here is necessary in order for the, for the electromagnetic current to be conserved, okay? If I, if I, don't, add, if I don't include this quantity here, then the electromagnetic current is not, is not going to be conserved. It will be anomalous. And if I don't include this term here, I will not be able to write, uh, to define this current as the, as the derivative of the, of the effective action respect to the gauge field, okay? And this, in precisely these two quantities here are the responsible for those transfer coefficients because as you saw, they just depend on background fields. So this, uh, This, this, these three terms, or I mean, these, these terms, these terms, these terms are just background fields. They don't depend on the, they don't depend on density or temperature. So that's precisely evaluating those, those uh, polynomials for, for that configuration of the background fields. And they are there just by consistency. So you're saying that this B and E actually are part of the gauge field and the VL bind background? Background VL yes. bind and, okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Now, uh, welcome. So, okay. Now, I will just try to 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 construct a quantum field theory that I that is, I can understand for the multivile for the multivile system because then this multivile system has this p square of p to the q, and 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 they are kind of confusing. In one of the reasons also they are kind of confusing is because. Uh, at the moment, there was some evidence that this type of, 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 uh, of system had also quantum anomalies. But the point is that the, all the quantum anomalies that at least we studied in the, or they are written, in, I mean, that they are discussed in the textbooks, textbooks are like anomalies for, for relativistic systems. So then what's going on here? 
why do we have a quantum anomaly? So it seems that the paradigm of quantum anomalies go, be, go beyond from goes beyond the relativistic quantum field theory story. Okay, and then to sort of simplify the multivice system, we propose the following. Okay, so one of the requirements for for, for the for this type of multivice is that I mean you have to impose some lattice uh, symmetry. Okay, there is required some lattice symmetry for, for, for that type of multivalent systems, which is basically you need to have some C4 or C6, C4 for n equal 2 or C6 uh, symmetry, which is basically discrete rotations on a plane of the lattice symmetry. Okay, so the system has to, has to have that invariance. Okay, and now we say the following, just imagine that we have just some, some, some system with uh, some pseudo spin that I am just like capturing with this, uh, matrices tau, okay? And those particles have spin, has, has real spin, okay? Which basically are the degrees of freedom I'm just, cap I'm just like taking into account with this identity matrix two by two, okay? Now this Hamiltonian is a four by four, okay? The, the original Hamiltonian I, I, I showed by, by, for the multivalent system is just like two by two. But I'm just, okay, forget about this two by two Hamiltonian and let's just play this game. I take this uh, pseudo spin, uh, degrees of freedom, and let's assume this is free spin, degrees of freedom, okay? And now we say, okay, which are the most generic sort of like perturbations I can add to that Hamiltonian, which are invariant under C4? C4 will act in this form, okay? Uh, this alpha will be pi half or, or, or pi or three, depending on, on, on if, if it's C4 or C6, okay? But then, okay, this is tau Z, and as I said, this is the spin matrix in the set direction, spin matrix in the set. So I have, I have rotations in the XY plane. And then we, could, we realize that there are three perturbations. I can add this one. But then if I add this perturbation to the Hamiltonian, I diagonalize the Hamiltonian, I realize that what I obtain in the dispersion relation are two value points with the spirality. Okay, that's not what I want. And then I have two other two possibilities, which are these combinations here, okay? These combinations will give me two bands that will be gap. I don't care about them, about, about those ones. And the other two bands will touch in a point and will have this dispersion relation, okay? Which if I take the limit delta going to infinity, delta is the coupling, I'm just imagine that I put a delta in front of here. I, I add, I include that to this Hamiltonian. I diagonalize and I get that dispersion relation. If the limit with delta is large enough, then this, the dispersion relation takes, takes this form, which is precisely the dispersion relation of the, of the multivile, of the multivile system, okay? Now, having that Hamiltonian, the single particle Hamiltonian that somehow has a, a, a relativistic structure, I can just write a field theory with that precise perturbation. Again, so this is my pseudo spin matrix that is linear in momentum. And this is the, and I'm picking one of those perturbations with this, with this coupling delta, okay? But if you see that Lagrangian, and at least if you are a, a high energy theorist, you automatically will realize that this is just like a flavor, like that's like a fermion with a flavor symmetry that is coupled to a background gauge field. It is non abelian. And the, and the spin matrices S are just playing the role of the generators of the symmetry group, okay? So what is interesting here is that this thing, that it's like a sort of unified picture captured the physics of an, a generic N monopole. And the point is that if I plug here uh, a spin one half matrices in the generators of the group SU2, with the group SU2, I will obtain N equal two. If I plug here N equal one, I mean, if I spin one matrices for the generators, I get, I get N equal three and so on and so forth. So it means that the only thing, so the point is that the higher values of the, of the monopole are just basically the dimension of the representation of SU2, of SU2 I'm using to couple uh, the background field, okay? So in other, so just like to summarize, for n equal two, the matrices has to be spin one half. For for n equal three, the matrices have to be 
uh, n equal one. So the story is that this, uh, the presence of the background field explicitly breaks the SU2 and explicitly breaks the Lorentz, the Lorentz symmetry. I mean, well, it's not weird. We already knew that the system was, uh, was not invariant under, under um, rotations. So it has to break the, the Lorentz group, okay? It breaks the Lorentz group, but preserve a new one. And actually that the U1 that is preserved is, precise, is precisely the continuous version of the, of the C4 or C6 symmetry that we were imposing in the, in the system, okay? So in the end, the full system will have all translations, will have a reduced SO1 comma one. We still have a U1 that is associated to the phase shifting of the, of the fermions. And, and this U1 is just associated to the rotations in the plane. Uh, we had in the in the original system. Okay, then from the classical perspective again, so if we have this SU2, we will have a, a conserved symmetry, a conserved a conserved current that I'm just calling JMUI, JMUA, we will have the a U1 current that will be conserved, conservation of translations, conservation of angular momentum. But everything we learned before related with anomalies automatically telling us that, okay, well, this, this, this symmetry here and this symmetry here will be anomalous, okay? And then in principle, if just setting delta equals zero, just a first, uh, if we have the first uh, approach to this, I mean, the first study to the, to the problem, we just set delta equals zero. In that case, we will have, ah, and we double the degrees of freedom in the sense that now, everything we were discussing was just like for a left-handed particle. Now we, we put a copy, a left-handed copy and a right-handed copy again. And we just apply the formulas for the anomalous transport and we obtain these relations for the, for the currents, for the electromagnetic current and for the axial current. What is interesting here is that now the, the, the monopole charge ap appears in front of, in the current magnetic conductivity, but there is a new coefficient that appears in, in the transport coefficients, which is DCN, which is basically, is, ba is, is basically the trace of, of two generators. So trace of two generators will be proportional. So it will be basically CN times delta AB. Okay, this is a coefficient that depends on which representation we are. Okay. And then for the non-abelian currents, okay, we will have again some sort of like a relations that are not very much illuminating in this expression. In, in, I mean, in, in this case, but just let's recall this one here, okay? Because the point is that then we decided to, in order to test all this field theory construction, we decided to propose a tight binding model for a multivile system, okay? which is basically, we take, so this, this Hamiltonian here, this Hamiltonian here gives me the, a single bisemi metal, okay? For example, here we see the, the band touching that, that is linear, okay? And we construct the multi bisemi metal using this, the, the, the same spirit, okay? We just multiply by I N and we add the perturb this perturbation here. And then we see after diagonalizing the, the, the time binding model that we have so this here we have linear in this direction. So this is not going, so this horizontal axis is not just K, Kx or Ky. So this uh, goes like, for example, from Kx, when you reach the, the, the center, then you turn to Ky. So the, the here we see, for example, the linear and the quadratic. And for the cubic, uh, for the n equal three, again, linear and then cubic in this direction, okay? Now for this side by the model, we can apply a magnetic field in the system, diagonalize and verify, for example, what happens with this induced charge we were, that, that were appearing. And for the case of the, of the electromagnetic charge that is induced by applying a magnetic field that is parallel to the, to the vial cone splitting, this is prediction, the field theory prediction. And all the points here are just like the, the numerical data from the tight binding model. So for, single vial for the double vial and for, for the for the triple vial okay with a perfect agreement and then even more sort of exotic in the case of this uh, isospin charge density 
um, we can observe the following. If you apply, so, well, here we don't need to apply uh, a B3, okay? Because let me just go back here to the Hamiltonian, to the Lagrangian. So if you see this, this background gauge field, this background gauge has an intrinsic magnetic field, okay? Even though it's a constant, when you compute the commutator of uh, the gauge field, a with, I mean, of the gauge field with itself, it will not be zero, okay? If you compute the commutator of the gauge field with, with itself, you will have a magnetic field that is pointing along the third direction in the, in the internal spin space, spin space, okay? So the system has already an intrinsic, uh, let me say, let me call it isospin magnetic field, which means that for that uh, tight binding model without applying anything, in principle, you should you should see that uh, generation of this uh, row three, which is precisely so that the straight lines are are the, the fitting from from the from our formula, the field theory formula, and as you can see, the dots fit quite well, at least in some regime for small delta. Okay, so any questions so far? Okay, cool. So, of course, I mean, we don't have a clear picture of what's like the physical interpretation of what this row three is. We know that has to be related with some spin density or something of this kind, because in the end, that SU two is is associated with a, with a spin degree of freedom. Uh, but certainly, that's something that has to be explored with more detail. But uh, but in any case, it's like Kind of nice that uh, all the field theory construction is just like supported by by the type binded uh, analysis. On top of that, if there is something else that we can extract from the from this uh, type binding model, and it's just like the Fermi arcs uh, of the system. So if you just comp if you put a boundary, we know that Bayesian methods have something that is called like the Fermi arcs on the boundaries. If you do that, then we will conclude that for the single Bayesian metal, you will have a one a single Fermi arc. If you have the double bile semi-metal, the, the, you will, I mean, you should have as many Fermi arcs as the, as the value of the interior, the monopole interior. So in the case of n equal two, you have in the, at, the, at the surface, you have n equal two and n equal three, we see three Fermi, three Fermi arcs. Okay, so, um, okay. Just let me just now move to, some of the signals uh, we have related with the with the anomalous transport. Okay, the most common one is the magnetic transport. Okay, I will not I will not go in, into the details of how it's computed. I will just again sketch and give you some some idea on how the the magnetic transport happens. So let's suppose that we have that, that we can hydrodynamically describe the system. Okay. But momentum is not a hydrodynamic uh, degree of freedom. So the momentum relaxation in the system is so fast that momentum is not, is not playing any role. So we have only charge, approximate charge conservation for the axial charge and energy conservation, okay? And then this, these two expressions, so this is just like the carrier magnetic conductivity. This is the <coughs> carrier magnetic conductivity and the energy current. So if you just take this, current, you plug it here, you take this current and you plug it here, you just, you will get, so for example, this term here, the gradient will act on, on, on mu, gradient mu. So if you move this thing to the left, you just, you will get just something like the gradient of the electrochemical potential dot magnetic field that is just sourcing charge via the anomaly. Then this term, when you plug it here, it will produce something similar. So the first term will give you again, gradient of electrochemical potential dot magnetic field sourcing uh, energy. But then there will be a gradient of T dot magnetic field that is also sourcing. So it means that if I have a gradient of temperatures parallel to the magnetic field, it will also source, it will also start modifying the energy of the system. Okay, now, we assume some sort of like relaxation time approximation, which means that, okay, we, let's assume that, so 
in principle, the axial charge is not an exact symmetry. I mean, it's not an exact conserved quantity. So we introduce, uh, you can introduce some sort of relaxation time approximation, which in practice means, okay, all the rho dot and, it, and epsilon dot is just like a, this M is some sort of generalized relaxation time. This is a matrix. Okay, if you plug this thing here and you invert for delta mu and delta t, when you obtain the out of equilibrium values for delta mu and for delta t, you plug it back in the uh, energy current and in the, in the electromagnetic current, and that will give you expression of this form. So it will give you that electric current will have, of course, will have always this uh, the ohmic contribution to the current, but then there will be a B square term that will be proportional to the uh, gauge coefficient, the gauge anomaly coefficient, which I'm just like capturing with this A chi. And the, in the case of the of this uh, thermoelectric conductivity, we will have also a B square term, but this term will be proportional to A chi and A g, to the gravitational anomaly coefficient and the, and the gauge anomaly coefficient. Okay, then in particular, the case of the of the carrel man, so the of the magnetotransport in the or usually called longitudinal uh, negative magnetic resistance that has been observed in like, several experiments. Okay, here we see that. So this is on all these plots. So in, in most of the plots, here is plot the the resistance. So it's basically the inverse of the con, of, of the conductance, and we see that there is a sort of like this. Oops. It's a sort of like a, a B to the minus two behavior. There is always a region in magnetic field in which the, the, in the in which the magnetic resistance decreases. Okay, in this case, for this exper for for these experiments, they they already plot the, the conductance, and then we see this kind of nice parabola in the magnetic field in the conductance. And this particular this particular one. It's like quite interesting. This is the Mercury telluride that I that I mentioned before. So in that case, precisely they can tune the the, the, the location of the Fermi of the Fermi energy, and then basically along this direction, what they are just showing is the Fermi is the is the chemical potential. Basically, they are tuning the chemical potential along this direction, and, and along this other one, they are just tuning the magnetic field, and we we see this nice uh, behavior that with the magnetic field the the longitudinal magnetic system decreases. There is a, there is one experiment that uh, that measure the the thermoelectric conductivity, the longitudinal magneto thermoelectric conductivity, uh, and it was quite uh, amazing because they managed to to see this quadratic type of behavior in the magnetic field in the in the thermoelectric conductivity. Therefore, that that's that has been like the first evidence of the of the presence of the mixed gravitational anomaly in nature. Because uh, in, in I mean we have in, in particle physics I mean on the standard model we have seen what happens with the with the pure gauge anomaly via the decay of the of pions. But in in particle physics, in observing the the gravitational anomaly is basically impossible because it will be like uh, suppressed by the by the Planck mass. However, here in Valsemi Metas, we already have, a, well, there is a single experiment. We hope that in the near future, we have more experiments, but this is an, so, some evidence of the, of the presence of the, of the anomaly, of the, of the gravitational anomaly. This is sort of like more, this is quite nice also. It's more, more evidence regarding the, 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 the presence of the kernel magnetic effect on, 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 on materials. Somehow this is like more, it's, it's like closely related what should happen in, for example, in the quark gluon plasma, because this is, um, I mean, the, this experiment is, is called like non-local measurements of the chiral magnetic effect. Just like, let me tell you what uh, they did here. So, so the point is the following. So you have a localized region of space in which you apply an electric field that is parallel to the magnetic field. You have the magnetic field distributed all over the all over the sample, a constant magnetic field distributed all over the sample, but the electric field is just localized in one region. So via the anomaly, you have in this region you have E dot B. So the anomaly tells you that you should start creating 
uh, you should start like pumping axial charge in the system, okay? And then, of course, that, that charge will just like diffuse all over the sample, okay? But then if you have the magnetic field here, the color magnetic effect tells you that if you have in, in this region a certain amount of charge, this charge should flow parallel to the magnetic field and you should split. You should just like separate charges. And then what they do is just they measure the voltage in the sample far away from the region where you have this electric field applied, okay? And then in this plot, what they show is just basically the negative magnetic resistance. So this plot is just the, resi the resistance in this region. We see again how the resistance decreases with the, with the magnetic field. And then green and red lines in this case is just the voltage far away in two different points. I mean, like in two different regions far away from the, from the region. So the electric field is applied here. And then they measure voltage here and voltage here. They have magnetic field everywhere. And then we see that we have a non-trivial response uh, with the magnetic field which is a non-trivial uh, um, sort of like a cross-check of the, the charge pumping via the, via the chiral magnetic effect. So I mentioned that it's sort of like closely related what should happen in the quark-gluon plasma because basically uh, in the quark-gluon plasma, what should happen is like a, there is some early stage in which the axial charge should be generated in the system. We don't, we don't know how to, to model properly how this axial charge uh, is generated by some, but by some out of equilibrium topological excitations. And then the point is that when this af afterwards, the only thing you have is magnetic field and the magnetic field should sh separate the charges, which is somehow what is just like happening here. This, in some region space, you just like generate that, that axial charge. And then here you just see the chiral magnetic effect just acting. It's just, you see two things. In one, in one side, the, the charge pumping via the anomaly, and in the other, and in the other, in the other hand, in the other side, you are just see, seeing basically chiral magnetic effect. Okay, so um, yes, I, I think I should stop here probably, because uh, yes, I've yes. been like talking for a really long time. So, and then I, I'm afraid people should start to be, I mean, should be already tired. So I don't know if you want guys, I, I could just like uh, give another time uh, a talk just like discussing all this trunk coupling um, story. So- Yes, Fran. Yes. Yeah, you, you can give another talk. Yeah, I think uh, that yeah, would yeah. be great. Yeah, yeah uh, I was trying to cover, I was trying to cover everything, but uh, yes, it was like too much. So if you, if you want, I, I could do that another, I mean, all the strong coupling discussion. Sure. Time. So just then let me just put this uh, final slide with some uh, like final comments um, in which, okay, I mean, it's, I mean, it's cool that this uh, balsamic metals are just like, uh, I mean, from my perspective, one of the reasons that bikes and metros are cool is just like, it's just like a tabletop system that somehow to somehow emulate uh, a minimal universe in the sense that we can test many ideas of quantum field theory, like for example, anomalies. We could also explore now these multi and methods are opening the door for, for, ex for exploring non abelian anomalies, which is also quite exciting. Um, there are other type of anomalies that in principle, I mean, has been predicted that uh, they should have also imprinted in, 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 in transport in by semi-metals, which are like the conformal anomalies, which is something I didn't discuss, but uh, I leave just the reference there. Um, something that, that I find like really astonishing is how this type of relativistic symmetries can emerge in a crystal, which is something that is completely non, that is, some, that is an object that basically, I mean, it's, is absent. I mean, continuous symmetries are, are absent in the in the in the in the microscopic description of a of a of a crystal. But then there is this kind of like a emergence of symmetries uh, when you go to to low energies, in particular this type of relativistic kind of relativistic symmetry. So then I just leave like this sort of provocative question: like, I mean, is, is it possible that our universe is a crystal? Or is it possible that we live in a crystal and 
all the symmetries we see in this in the in the in, in the universe in the universe are just like some emergent symmetries that uh, that we see because we cannot go to we cannot uh, see in a smaller distance uh, or a small enough distance. So yes, uh, I'll stop here. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, great. Thanks for the wonderful talk, Fran. It was really amazing. I really liked the your uh, your your exposition of this multi wild semi metals, especially that was very interesting. Uh, just have one question then. Uh, so when you have this uh, transition here that you described, uh, what happens exactly at the phase transition point? Do you understand that, uh, especially in the case of this multi wild stuff that you were talking about? Well, in the case of a multiple is not. Uh, you mean the when you were tuning the separation and the yes. mass that they can just kind of uh, annihilate. Okay, yeah, that's a quite interesting point because basically what happens is that that point has a. Uh, I mean, there is no. This point is still is still gapless, and it's a. Uh, it has a kind of Lipschitz symmetry. Um, what happens is that. Uh, in the single vial case, in the in case in which you have re really vial cones, what happens is that the, the the particles will propagate linearly along the transverse directions, but along the direction of the annihilation, they will propagate quadratically. Okay, it's a it's leaf sheet like in the sense that typically what people refer to as a leaf sheet uh, scaling theory is a theory in which time scales differently than space. Okay, but here what happens is that the transverse space-time, let's say, to the to this uh, annihilation direction, like uh, propagate relativistically, scale relativistically, and then the transverse direction has a different uh, scale exponent. Um, then, and then precisely in that in, in the strongly coupled uh, part, I well, I, I will just show one one slide, which is uh, so, which is. So something that is has been observed in holography, but also in, with a good coupling, people has been has computed. So this this plot here is just like a is the emergence of a of a whole conductivity in 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 the vial semi metal that should appear around the, around the critical point. Okay, so the critical point should be still precisely somewhere here where you have, where you see the maximum. So in it may be weird for you to like to hear about the whole viscosity because uh, um, in principle. In three dimensions, whole viscosities are not allowed if you have a high isotropy, but that's the point that the system is not isotropic. You are breaking the isotropic by, by this uh, uh, vector field that is splitting the, 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 the cones and then whole viscosity is allowed. But then the puzzle here is that this, this parameter you see down here in the denominator, this zeta parameter is, an, is a gravitational anomaly coefficient which means that if the gravitational anomaly coefficient um, is zero, the whole viscosity is zero. So somehow it seems to be, it seems that this whole viscosity is also uh, anomaly related. But the big puzzle is that at that precise point, there is no reality, okay? So what, what kind of axial anomaly we are talking about? There is no such a thing as a chiral anomaly in, in the low energy description of the system. So in fact, um, yeah, there has been some sort of arguments that there is some sort of like em emergent anomaly in the low energy theory uh, of the system for at that precise point, which is somehow controlling that transfer coefficient. But that's like something really new. It's, uh, it's like full of uh, open questions. But then there is a new transfer coefficient in that precise point that seems to be also anomaly related. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I have a question. Uh, can I? Speak? Yes, please. Oh, uh, Frank. So, do you know what this B uh, field corresponds to experimentally? Which field? The B field that you were just mentioned, like the one Small that B. the one that yes, the one that induces the transition. It's the separation of the vial of the vial points. Yeah, but experimentally, yeah. what was that correspond that moment? Is, 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 the, is that separation? So that distance, that distance is that field. Yes, okay. but how can you... 
No, so it's it not something that you can induce, right? No, it's, it's intrinsic to the system. Okay, the constant okay. value is intrinsic. So you just imagine that again, we have the, like this simple model with two vicons. Okay, mm -hmm. two vicons that are sitting in two different places. That distance is the background value, is constant background value for that field. Now just imagine that you do some perturbation to the material, like straining the material. Just imagine that you strain the material in some way such that in different places, the separation, of, in different places of the material, real space, the effective separation of the, of the by points changes. Mm -hmm. So that will somehow, that, that would be the way of generating a, a B field that is X dependent. Okay, there are already several proposals for, for like generation of like this uh, axial magnetic fields or, or this kind of thing, just like by straining. In principle, should, I mean, should be possible. It's like by straining the material to generate this uh, axial, this B5, this axial magnetic field. But in, in principle, like you showed, yes, but in principle, you showed both uh, as valsamine metals, so a direct semi metal and a real valsamine metal. So is it clear what, what do you have to do to, to get one or the other? Or is it just something that you just do? Um, okay, there, are, there are some proposals. There are some proposals in principle, if you, if you imagine that this is okay. This, the, can you see me or? Uh, oh, you see, wait. You see my, my image? Now I need to put, okay, now I see it. Yeah. So, okay. So, yeah, the point is imagine that you have you know, like some sort of like a some chunk of material with this form. If you take it and you twist it like this, that should generate an axial magnetic field in, in this direction. So then there are some proposals to take like some block of, of a balsamy metal, just like twist it by in, in this form and then to explore other phases, let's say, of, of the current magnetic effect via the generate generation of these axial magnetic fields. That's uh, one of the examples I, I'm aware of. Oh, great, thank you. Any further questions? Ayun Long has a question. Uh, sorry, just a short question. Maybe I missed that point. I mean, uh, so what is the major difference of the strongly coupled ring and the weakly coupled ring of the semi-metal? Okay, so far, uh, the strongly coupled description is just like more more an academic uh, exercise than than uh, phenomenologically relevant in the sense that all the materials that we uh, observe they have a a description or or at least the weak the weakly coupled description is good enough to describe what's going on there. I see. Okay. I see. It, it doesn't mean that there could be, in principle, some weird by some method that we discover in the future in which the electrons will interact uh, strongly coupled because somehow, so the story here is kind of similar with, with graphene. So if you just estimate the value of the, of the alpha of the, of the electromagnetic coupling, it will, it will be just like a, uh, yeah, it will be, like order, it should be like bigger than one in the sense that the Fermi, because the Fermi velocity here is, is the same as in, I mean, it's like in graphene. It's like some order of magnitude be, be below the, the speed of light, such that when you plug in the, in the, in the electromagnetic coupling constant, should give you a number that is uh, of order one, okay? So I don't know if it could happen that for some specific materials, it, this alpha is so large, you could get an alpha that is large enough such that the system can it will be like really strongly coupled and, 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 and the weakly coupled techniques will not be enough to do for, for the, to describe. So far, everything, all, all the examples we know are well described with weakly coupled. Uh, I see. I see. You, you mean for the experimental days, in, in principle, it's all in the weakly coupled range in the current materials. What we, that's, that's what happens to, with the system we, we have seen so far. I see. Okay, thank you.
I can hear you, Ayan. You're mute, Ayan. Okay, sorry, I just, sorry. I, oh, sorry, I probably didn't. Are there any more questions first <laughs> before I? Okay, then if not, I'll just ask a very short question to Fran. Uh, so in this case of uh, multi-wild semi-metals, uh, would you be able to also uh, turn on some, some of these actual non-abelian uh, background magnetic fields? using some mechanical thing or you, you can, can one can explore this using mechanical methods or some other methods? I mean, that's, that's an trivial question for several reasons. So as, as, as I show, shown before, there are like plenty, like several of ICM methods, single ICM methods in, in the market. Okay, there are millions of experiments and millions of labs like doing experiments with them. The case of the multi-bias semi-metals is not uh, as uh, developed. So I think there are a couple, I think there are a few uh, experiments reporting that, I mean, claiming that they have seen that type of, uh, of systems, but they are like much more like subtle. So from the experimental, first of all, from the experimental point of view, there's no much, uh, at least that I'm aware of, that there are no like, many examples. And then secondly, um, I mean, that sort of like field theory construction is something that we've done with it, like recently. Um, and there is not like full understanding of what's going on, okay? So, I mean, all this like non and symmetry and it's not really current and all this story is not like really clear what i mean if i have to tell an experimenter it's like okay do that in order to see this uh response associated to the non abelian i don't know what i have to tell them okay i don't know what i have to tell them to check because i don't really know exactly what are we which are like the physical quantities they have to measure so that's something that really needs to to be explored so uh, somehow I mentioned that my, my intuition tells me that those non-abelian currents should be like related with the uh, with um, um, spin with a kind of spin current, but it's not just. I mean, it's not a sort of like a quantitative statement. I don't really know exactly. That's something that has to be like properly worked out, and and, uh, and then going in the case of like generating this uh, axial non-abelian gauge phase is even more, I think it's even beyond the, the, the current understanding we have in the story. So I, I, I don't really know. So it's something that has to be like really explored. Okay. So thanks Fran for this extremely fascinating and stimulating talk. And thanks for giving so much of your time and effort. Uh, so we hope to have your talk again, maybe uh, in, in one of the other sessions. Uh, later this year or maybe in the beginning of next year. So yeah, thanks again and uh, hope to see you all everybody uh, in the next week. Uh, our next speaker will be Yoon Long, who is in the, still in the audience. So Yoon Long, you can already say what you're going to talk about maybe? Or... Uh, sure, sure. Basically, I think I will connect you with this kind of cut of holography and uh, relevant uh, to this kind of cosmological issue and so on So I will update the title to you. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here is Yulong who told us who is what's going to speak about. So see you next week, all of you. Have a nice weekend sure. and bye. Ciao. Thank you.